Something twisted my brother's head clean off. I found out what it was. I wasn't the one that found Maddie. It was his wife, Elizabeth, back from a night shift at the hospital, eager to shed her scrubs and settle in for a long sleep. Instead, she walked into the bedroom to find Maddie sitting in a chair, his severed head in his lap. I would have preferred not to hear any further details about my brother's body, but when Elizabeth called me on the phone, hysterical, she couldn't help but overshare. Dark bruises covering his arms and legs. There was blood everywhere, soaking through his white t-shirt and striped pajama pants, pulling all around the wicker chair where he had sat. The skin of his neck was frayed where it had been ripped apart, almost like a popped balloon. The muscle, too, was stretched and torn, and the vertebrae stuck from the top of his neck hole like a white sleeping worm. Though we hadn't spoke much in the last few years, I was the only family Maddie had left. I caught the next flight to Boston and met up with Elizabeth at her parents' house. She started screaming as soon as she saw me, or maybe she'd been screaming all day. Maybe I looked too much like my brother for her to handle. After a few hours, she calmed down enough to start saying a few words. I asked her if Maddie had been in any kind of trouble. He'd been reckless in his late teens and early twenties, selling drugs on campus. It was small time stuff, but he'd made a few bad enemies. Guys that put a real scare into him one night that made him get out of the game altogether. There was nothing like that, she said. He's totally clean. Got a good job clearing out old houses. Like when someone dies, he gets all the junk out, gets it sorted. Helps sort out the junk from the antiques, takes commission of the sales. Does he skim? I asked. Maybe someone felt cheated. She shook her head. He buys the stuff he likes, but it's always a fair price. Everybody loved him. Everybody. The cops investigated, of course, but there were no leads. No evidence of a break-in. No one with a grudge. It was like Maddie had twisted his own head off and set it in his lap. One of the detectives mentioned that more than half of murders go unsolved. It seemed this would be one of them. Weeks passed, and I stuck around, trying to help Elizabeth put her life back together. Even after the police were done scouring her place, she refused to go back in. We hired some people to clean up the blood, but they told me there was only so much they could do. The hardwood in the bedroom would never give up that stain. Finally, it fell on me to go into the place and gather a few of Elizabeth's things. They were going to put it up for sale. She was still in pieces, planning to move back in with her parents, probably permanently. I rented a truck and some basic tools, told her I'd get to work. Up until that point, I'd been staying in a cheap Airbnb nearby, but with Maddie's house reopened, I figured I could spend a few nights there while I packed up. When I mentioned the idea, Elizabeth gave me a weird look. You shouldn't stay there, she said. Why not? I asked, but she couldn't come up with a good reason. Of course, the day I got into the place, the first thing I did was head to the bedroom. I guess I just had to see it. The cleaners had clearly scrubbed the hell out of the place, but there was still a nasty stain in the center of the room. The mark was roughly circular and maybe three feet across, mostly gray but grew darker at the edges, almost black. Before she sold the house, Elizabeth would have to have the boards replaced, maybe put in carpeting, something. For a few seconds, I just stood there, looking at the black circle, imagining my brother inside it, permanently. Once I'd spent a few moments staring, I looked up from the stain, really taking the place in for the first time. Elizabeth hadn't been kidding about the antiques. All over the apartment were old hutches and paintings of ships at sea, sets of China and cigar store Indians. My brother had always had an eye for quality. The thing that really stuck with me, though, was a wood carving of an owl, which was standing right in the corner of their old bedroom. The thing was larger than life, coming all the way up to my shoulder, carved all of a single trunk of elm. It was one solid piece, save for a single amber eye made of glass inlay. The other eye hole was empty, giving the odd impression that the carving was winking at you. The wood had been the cord maybe a dozen times, leaving it with an uneven plastic sheen. Deep cracks ran through one of the wings in the neck, and the base was discolored from water damage. It certainly didn't look lifelike, yet, somehow, it felt oddly alive. All afternoon, as I packed boxes of Elizabeth's clothes and shoes, the eye followed me. I'm usually not the kind of guy to get spooked by anything, but I guess after everything that happened to Maddie, I got kind of on edge. Eventually, I threw an old towel over the carving's head, covering the eye. It felt a little stupid, but it made me feel a little better. A few hours went by. A bunch of boxes got packed and it started to get dark. My first instinct was to sleep in the living room, away from the stain, and honestly, away from the owl. I turned off the lights and stretched out on the couch, but it was old and lumpy, impossible to get comfortable. Maddie's mattress, practically brand new, lay untouched in the other room. Finally, after maybe an hour of rolling around, my back aching from the day of hard labor, I grabbed the blanket and headed for Maddie's old room, carefully walking around the black circle. As I tossed the blanket on the bed, I looked in the corner of the room at the owl carving. 
The towel I tossed over its head lay on the ground now. I wondered how it had fallen off. Maybe I'd been careless when I covered the statue in the first place. The eye caught the moonlight, watching. As stupid as it made me feel, I got up and walked over, picking the towel off the floor. As I did, I heard a distinct sound, something like a rat's feet skittering inside the owl. I jumped back halfway to the bed, still holding the towel in my hand. For a moment, I stared at the carving, daring it to move, waiting for another sound. Nothing. The whole time though, even as I was watching it, the amber eye watched me. Slowly, I walked back to the carving and threw the towel over it. Then, I backed across the room to the bed, not quite realizing I was stepping through the black circle on the floor. Finally, I collapsed into the mattress, curled under the blanket, and fell asleep. I awoke to a cracking sound. At first, everything was still. Then, through the moonlit near dark of the room, I watched as the owl statue began to move. First, its left wing pushed out from inside, then its right. The wood pushed out perhaps five inches, revealing something black and skeletal inside. It almost looked like the Transformers Maddie and I had played with as kids, unseen robots pushing out through the plastic panels of a vehicle to reveal their hidden, shiny bones. I lay transfixed as two thin black legs pushed out hidden panels near the owl's base. The black legs, at least, they seemed like legs, couldn't have been much wider than a curtain rod. They pushed all the way down to the floor. Then, the whole carving began to move toward me. The wood swayed and some unseen thing inside it, some tooth and creature was wearing the wooden owl like armor. I looked for a way out. I could have jumped through the window, but I was on the second floor, and the thing was moving too fast now anyway. As it reached the bed, it reached out, its thin, black arms growing impossibly long, its hands flattening and growing wide like dinner plates. Then it placed them over my ears, and everything went black. I woke to find myself sitting on a wooden chair from the kitchen. The owl must have brought it in while I was passed out. It had placed me inside the black circle. I thought of Maddie, sitting here just like me, not that long ago. I tried to move, but the long black rods that I had assumed were the owl's legs bound my ankles to the chair. Its hands still gripped my head, the grip only slightly more relaxed than when it had first grasped me. The carving itself stood only a few inches in front of me. Though it fixed me with its amber eye, I could see now that the other eye hole was now open, revealing something black and moving inside. What are you? I asked, barely able to speak. I think it laughed. At least, it sounded a little like a laugh. I'm not quite an owl, it said. Its voice was low, echoing out through the cracks in the owl's wooden shell. I'm not quite a person either. Some days I feel closer to bird, some days closer to man. But actually, I've been around long before owls ever flew. Of course, it continued. Owls are generally far less interesting than humans. They're basic creatures. Give them a moonlit night and a field full of frightened mice, and they'll be happy. So happy. Every single time. For humans, nothing is ever enough. It clicked its tongue, then got quiet. But there is one area in which owls truly excel, which I have always admired, it said. They are fantastic at turning their heads, so much better than humans. It's an area where it's not even a competition, not even close. As it said this, I felt the pressure from its plate-like hands increase against my temples, and it turned my neck about 90 degrees to the right. Not enough to hurt exactly, but it was certainly uncomfortable. I thought of Matty, his head twisted clean off and set carefully in his lap. Why are you doing this? I asked. Because, as I said, humans are interesting, but also frustrating. Not to belabor the comparison to owls, but truly, your eyesight is quite poor. And not just your night vision, your ability to see yourselves is quite abysmal. Watching you with only one eye, I can see truth about you that you simply cannot face. What the hell are you talking about? I screamed. It held the black finger to its beaks, shushing me. Please, it said. If you must scream, wait until you really, really must. Later in the game, it may be unavoidable. Game? I whispered. It's one of my own invention, though it's not too different than some human games. A little bit truth or dare, a little bit mercy, mostly mercy. The rules aren't complicated. I'll be telling you some truths about your life, unpleasant truths. Each truth will come with a bit of pain, both mental and physical. When you've had enough, simply speak the word mercy and your pain will be over. And my head will be in my lap, I said. Very good, it said. I knew you were a smart one. In that case, it sounds like no further explanation will be needed. Except that I should add, the result of this exercise will be inevitable. You will eventually beg for mercy. 
Out of compassion, I'll go ahead and offer you an opportunity to ask for it right now, just to spare yourself the pain ahead. For a moment, I considered the offer. It would be easy to let it simply do what it wanted, to give my head one great final twist. That would be it. Nothing would hurt after that. But something in me wasn't ready to let go. No, I said. Not yet. Deep from within the owl's wooden head, the dark thing looked out at me. Then, it seemed to nod. I felt its impossibly strong hands tighten around my head and began to turn it, perhaps ten more degrees to the right. It was definitely past the point of uncomfortable now. Along with this physical pain, I'll be stating a truth that carries a similar amount of mental anguish, said the dark thin thing. I would like to start by saying that you were never a good brother. As a boy, you were the golden child, taking all of your mother's love, allowing a narrative to develop that your brother was the eternal mess up. Though you pretended to be kind to him, secretly, deep down, you were happy to play the role of the favorite son. Sometimes, it even made you happy to hear your mother ranting at him, refusing him meals as he cried in his room, knowing that his misdeeds only made you look all the better. No, I said, trying to wriggle my neck free. Is that what Maddie said? I was a good brother. After mom used to tear into him, and go to his room, bring him snacks when she threw his dinner in the trash, I took care of him. The thing's hands tightened around my head, turning it ever farther. That happened once or twice, said the thing. It was little comfort to your brother. More often than not, he went to sleep hungry, well aware that no one loved him. Least of all, you. I wanted to say more, but I knew it would only bring pain. I held my tongue. Even in adulthood, you let your brother flounder, it said. It would have been so easy to help him out with a few thousand dollars. You knew he was destitute, selling drugs to make ends meet. He would have blown that money in a week, I said. Might have gone on the bender, gotten himself killed. No, it shouted, growing angry at me now. You were selfish. You wanted to see him twist in the wind. You wanted to be superior. It twisted my neck five more degrees. I could feel the skin growing tight as it twisted, the muscles beneath straining against the black hands. Why are you even here? It asked. You never visited when he was alive. Perhaps it actually frustrated you to see him getting his life together. Or is it Elizabeth? You always felt she was too good for Maddie, but you always secretly had a little crush, didn't you? Maybe now that he's dead. No, I said, and hot tears were starting to roll down my face. I was just trying to be a good brother. I swear. Too late. The thing shouted. Too late. It twisted my head again. I felt a wetness on my skin and wondered if I had begun to bleed. Mercy. The thing shouted. Simply say the word and this will all be over. Your brother suffered far less. I am sorry, Maddie. I said, just talking to the dark. I'm sorry. I did my best. I really did love you. Always. Mercy! Shouted the thing. Just keep going. I said. It'll be over soon enough, but I'll never ask for it. Never. As I said the words, the first rays of sun cut through the drawn shades. Where the ray struck the thing's hands, there was a smoky smell. Mercy. Quick! Or it'll only hurt worse! Shouted the thing. But there was a note of fear in its tone now. Go ahead then, I said. But it didn't. The sun shone more brightly. Slowly, the pressure in my temples began to ease. The black limbs withdrew. The owl began to back away into its corner. By the time dawn had finally flooded the room, the carving was back in its place. That morning, I returned to Elizabeth's parents' house with a few boxes of her things. I must have looked pretty wrecked, because she asked how I was doing, a note of concern in her voice. I'm okay, I said, but I can't stay here anymore. I've got to get home. She nodded, understanding. I've been thinking about it, she said, and I think I can handle the rest. I've been leaning on you too hard. Suddenly, a wave of panic flooded through me. Promise you won't stay there, I said. Promise. I would never, she said. I, even when Maddie was alive, I didn't like sleeping there. All those old antiques, I never liked the smell, but Maddie loved them, so. Thank you, I said, trying to stay composed, for being so good to him. She reached out and gave me a big hug. I know you two hadn't hung out much over the last few years, but Maddie always said you were there when he needed him, she said. Now, I see what he meant. She looked over at my rental truck. There, in the bed, lay the wooden owl. Is that one of Maddie's? She asked. I was hoping you'd let me have it, I said. One last thing to remember him by. She shrugged. I've never seen it before. Maybe he just gotten it. Yeah, I said. Could be. I said goodbye and got in the truck. And then I drove. I headed out in the city. Out where the urban sprawl gave way to some kind of forest. Marked with a few sunny meadows. When I was satisfied that I'd reached the middle of nowhere. 
I stopped. I took the statue from the bed of the truck and dragged it out into a sunny field. All the while, I heard the scudding sound inside. It was getting hot, toward afternoon, and I could tell the heat and light was affecting the thing inside. I knew the wood was full of little cracks. Some of them must have been big enough to let the light through. It's still only noon, I said. Not quite the hottest part of the day. It'll be hours from now, maybe at three or four. I wonder if you'll make it that far. A small shriek emerged from inside the owl. I ignored it. Now, over in the truck, I've got a saw, I continued. I could cut the owl shell of yours right in half and let the light take you. And I will. But first, I'm going to need you to ask for mercy.